On a warm California night, Cal Poly freshman Kristen Smart was enjoying her three-day weekend like a lot of her peers were. She was partying. Kristen was having a good day that day. She had called her parents earlier and left a voicemail on their machine saying that she had some good news for them and that she'd call back on Sunday. She then went out with a few of her friends and did the kind of aimless party hopping that a lot of us remember from our college days. But at some point, Kristen Smart ended up at a party alone. And it was this party that events would be set in motion that would lead to her seemingly vanishing off the face of the earth. The bright, bubbly college student never would call her family and tell them her good news. Instead, they would begin a quest for answers and justice that would last for the next quarter of a century, until April of 2021, when the light at the end of the tunnel finally seems to appear. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Kristen Smart. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone for joining us for this very special bonus episode. Um, You know, I was never planning on covering the Kristen Smart case because it's been extremely well publicized since 1996 and amazing journalists have done the work to bring her story to light. But just about a week before we're recording this, there was a huge, long-awaited break in the case, and I realized that a lot of people who are seeing this news may not really know the background. And some people, like my co-host over here, has never even heard the name Kristen Smart and has no idea what this news is. Yeah, no, nothing. Yeah, it's always so shocking to me, like, whenever you haven't heard of a huge case like this, but then... I just remember we have very different lives. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I I try to avoid the news as much as possible. Yeah. So, and when you do, it's like you listen to like local news, you listen to like WTOP. Yeah, I listen to the news that will help me get to work. Yeah. That's that's, that's what I listen to. So I did decide that I want to do Kristen Smart's story um, in order to give a condensed version and then catch everybody up on the latest developments that have been going on for the last week or so. Uh, So if you're unfamiliar with it, listen to this, and then immediately go to your podcast app of choice and download your own backyard. Host Chris Lambert did an incredible job um, a few years ago putting boots on the ground and investigating this case. So he's from the area where she disappeared, and he was only eight years old in 1996 when she went missing. So it's like he has no personal connection to this case at all. Other than the hometown. Yeah, and and just like seeing billboards for her yeah. growing up. You yeah. know, he's a musician. I, he's not even, he's not a journalist. He's not anything. But he made it his mission to get to the bottom of this. And he did, the podcast has like eight or 10 episodes or something like that. And it is so, so good. So everybody like this is going to give you your basic kind of, you know, timeline of events type situation and let you know what's going on now. But I would really, really recommend that everybody listens to that because it's just so well done. All right. So let's get started. Kristen Denise Smart was born on February 20th, 1977 to Stan and Denise Smart. Kristen was born in what was at the time Augsburg, West Germany. Stan and Denise were both teachers who were teaching the children of military members, which is why they were there. Kristen was their firstborn, and this job afforded the Smart family a seemingly exciting and adventurous life filled with travel. They eventually settled in Stockton, California, where Denise gave birth to two more children, a boy and a girl, but Kristen certainly didn't stay put. Like, just because, you know, they ended up in California doesn't mean that they completely put down roots. 
She spent her sophomore year of high school outside of London attending school with family friends. So like they just had friends all over the world, basically. So she just went to England for her sophomore year of high school and did it there. Oh, that's crazy. I know, right? It sounds amazing, though. I would have killed for that. And then the summer after she graduated high school, which was the summer of 95, she kind of got her dream job working as a lifeguard and a camp counselor at Camp Mokulea in Hawaii. What? Yeah. She just got to go to Hawaii for the summer and work at a camp. Uh, Yeah. Well, that sounds sounds like a dream. I know. yeah. Yeah. So it absolutely was a dream job for her. After this amazing summer, Kristen enrolled at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. Though Kristen stayed in state for school, she didn't stay like too close to home. Cal Poly is about 260 miles from where her parents live. Kristen's freshman year seemingly went well, you know, just a pretty standard freshman year. She worked as a lifeguard, um, you know, that year and did her schoolwork and, and made friends. But she was apparently having a bit of an issue uh, toward the end of the year. Apparently, finals had just happened and her biology exam was missing somehow. Mm, that's weird. Yeah. And it, like, it wasn't the end of the world, but it was looking like Kristen was going to have to retake it, which is obviously like the last thing, you know, you want to do. want to do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like at the end of a school year, you know, you just want to take off. Um. Her mother, Denise, thought that the good news that Kristen had called about was that her professor had found the exam. You know, Mm -hmm. that's just kind of what she assumed, but she would never actually find out. But either way, on the night of Friday, May 24th, 1996, Kristen wasn't thinking about exams. She and her friends were heading out to find a party. Now, you know I was not much of a partier in college, (laughs) but I do have fond memories of nights like this where you're with a group of friends and you don't have a particular destination in mind, but you know that if you like just wander around the neighborhoods by campus, you'll find something fun. Yeah, see, that's I never really did it that way. Oh, really? No. I always had a had like a planned party or planned destination to go to. Oh, that's if funny. I, if, if we weren't throwing a party ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which most of the time that's what we did. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and I did not. I, th- I think I threw one party the entire time I was in college and it was my senior year. Um, but no, I, I distinctly remember a couple nights, especially freshman year, when we didn't really know a lot of people yet. Mm -hmm. You know, my sweet mates and I would go out and it's like, well, I heard about a party here. I kind of heard about a party there, but we didn't like really know what was going on. And we just kind of went and figured it out. In their case, Kristen and her friends headed to Fraternity Row. On their way, they saw a friend of theirs in a pickup truck. So they flagged him down and the girls hopped in. They cruised around and just like hung out for the next couple of hours. Kristen had apparently heard that one of their friends, Ryan Swampy Fell, was. <laughs> should I, should I ask why? His I have no idea. Swampy? <laughs> I have no clue. And it's like I feel bad for poor Swampy because, like, you know, because he's tangentially involved in this case like podcasters 25 years later are calling him swampy which like he probably hasn't been called in 24 years yeah yeah he probably, i'm sure there's some sort of negative connotation to yeah or something but you know kristen liked him so All right. who knows um but if you are out there swampy i'm i'm sorry <laughs> But anyway, he was celebrating his birthday just off campus at 135 Crandall Way. Kristen wanted to go to the party, but none of her friends did. Apparently, that area was known for like having pretty rowdy parties, and it doesn't seem like that was the scene that Kristen's friends were into. But for whatever reason, Kristen was adamant about going to this party. So later that evening, they dropped her off a few blocks away, and then they went home. And at that point... Apparently, none of them had been drinking. Okay. Now, it, it, when they dropped her off, was mm-hmm. she by herself or did Swampy go with her? No, the party was at Swampy's house. So that's who she was going. So no, he wasn't with her. Like, they just literally dropped her off a few blocks away oh. from the house. Okay. And then she went alone. And so obviously, this is where I need to, you know, step in and be a mom. Yeah. 
As a 19-year-old college freshman, uh, the only concern that I would have had about going to a party alone would have been like social anxiety-based, not safety-based. I considered my college town to be incredibly safe, and I've always seen myself as someone who could be self-sufficient and take care of myself. So while Kristen kept on trying to convince her friends to go with her, I totally understand why she ultimately decided to go even when they didn't want to. Uh But, like, don't do that. You have to have each other's backs. Don't drop your friend off alone at a party, whether you're in college or you're an adult. Like, yeah, for sure. I mean, seriously, like this is not just something that kids shouldn't do. It's just something that people shouldn't do, you know, and, and keep in mind too, this is 1996. So there were no cell phones. Uh-huh. There were no, there was no way for her to quickly get in touch with anyone. And whether you're a man or a woman, the buddy system is imperative. And yes, Kristen's story ended up in tragedy, but there are so many less tragic but still awful things that happen to people every day. So, you know, we just all need to be there for each other. Always got to have backup. Yep. Kristen seemingly enjoyed herself at the party. And although it didn't seem like she had any close friends there, there were some people that she knew. One of these people was Cheryl Anderson. The California Register wrote a fantastic timeline of this case, which is linked on our blog. Basically, this was a typical college party with a lot of drinking and apparently some drugs. Some people say that Kristen wasn't drinking at all, while others say that she was, quote, chugging vodka. But honestly, like in a situation like that, it's hard to trust other party goers when it comes to what somebody else was drinking. Yeah, I mean, you know? who, who knows how many how many drinks they've had, how intoxicated right. they were. And I'm sure that the at, at the point where the the people at the party were telling people, telling reporters about this. Was, or police or, yeah. Or whoever, yeah, yeah. was, I'm sure, you know. Much, much later. Or, or later, so mm-hmm. I'm sure that they don't remember exact events. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, you can't, you really have to take that with a huge grain of salt. But... Kristen does sound like she was impaired. Whether it was from drinking or something else, I don't know. But when the party began to die down sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m., Kristen left and went to the neighbor's house to lie down on the lawn. <laughs> yeah. Also, a very college thing Right? To do. Like, nothing beats a good lawn lie down after a night like that. Yeah, yeah. Cheryl Anderson uh, at this point was looking around for her friends so that they could all walk back to their dorm together. She couldn't find them, but another student named Tim Davis offered to walk her back since his car was parked in the same direction that she was going. Cheryl was getting ready to leave when she saw Kristen lying on the lawn. And she and Kristen didn't really know each other that well. But Cheryl did like the 100% right thing here and was like, oh, no, no, we're not doing this. And she pulled Kristen to her feet so that she could walk back with her and Tim. Oh, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. The threesome had just started the slow walk back to campus when another student, Paul Flores, showed up. And Paul had been at the party and um, people had later reported seeing the two of them together at one point. He offered to help get Kristen back to her dorm. And so Kristen basically, like, it sounds like she was really out of it Mm -hmm. at this point. And so Cheryl and Tim welcomed the extra body. And Kristen basically put her arm around him and kind of like leaned on him for support Mm -hmm. as the four of them walked back to campus. So they made it back to where Tim's car was parked. And then Tim left leaving the other three to continue the rest of the way back to the dorms. Later in a deposition, Cheryl would say that Paul kept on telling Cheryl to go ahead because they were going a lot slower than her. Cause like Kristen was still just kind of hanging, hanging on, on him, him. Yeah. you know, but that didn't sit right with Cheryl. And so she's like, no, 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 it's cool. Like I'll wait for you guys. And so she would, you know, walk ahead and then like wait and wait for them to catch up. And what happened next changes everything everything and it's so chilling because they were all so close to being home safely (laughs) 
Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a podcast host as your realtor? No, of course you haven't. That would be insane. Hey, it's Kona here to tell you that we can make that insanity happen because I actually am a realtor based in Northern Virginia. So if you happen to live in the area, I can help you directly, but I can also help anyone around the world achieve your real estate goals because I have an amazing referral network that I work with and I help people everywhere. I also offer special incentives to veterans, to active military members, to AARP members, and so many more people. So if you are interested in buying, selling, renting, whatever it may be, all you need to do is go to my website, callcona.com, and we can connect. And I promise I will also give you all of the tea and all of the background info on this podcast if you want to. So again, that's callcona.com if you need real estate. So let's get back to the episode. And again, this is all according to that California register timeline that I mentioned. The three reached the intersection of Perimeter and Grand Avenue on the Cal Poly campus. Cheryl's dorm, Sierra Madre Hall, was just half a block away on Grand. Paul's dorm, Santa Lucia Hall, was just about 75 yards up perimeter. And Kristen's dorm, Muir Hall, was right behind Santa Lucia. So Cheryl, they're at this intersection. Cheryl's dorm is on Grand. Paul and Kristen's dorms are both on perimeter. Uh And they're all like... Super close. They could probably all see the buildings. Yeah. So given that they were all basically home at this point, Cheryl figured that she had done her duty and the night would end safely for everyone. So she decided that, you know, she was going to go her way. They were going to go their way. But then Paul got creepy. Oh, no. Mm hmm. So I don't know if Cheryl even knew Paul at all prior to this night or like if she literally just met him outside of the party. But even if she had run across him before, like they weren't close or anything like that. So when he asked her for a good night kiss. What? Yeah. She was understandably creeped out. Like what in the situation of shuffling a drunk acquaintance home at 2 a.m. <laughs> like makes him think that she was looking for romance. Yeah. Yeah. And so Cheryl obviously was like, no, thank you. (laughs) Um, But Paul wasn't deterred. He then asked her for a hug. And Cheryl's like, no, dude, it's not happening. Wow. Yeah. Like, read the room, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, given how this entire situation turned out, I think it's easy for some people to be like, oh, my God, Cheryl shouldn't have left Kristen alone with him. But, you know, we have to keep everything in context. They were literally yards away from their dorms. And yes, Paul was creepy, but he wasn't being overly aggressive or scary or anything like that. And also, let's just keep in mind that dudes in college are generally creepy. So I'm sure that was not the first time that Cheryl had had to deal with something like that. Yeah. And let's also keep in mind they're they're all 19 years old. Yeah. So Cheryl started back to her dorm and Paul and Kristen headed back toward theirs. The next morning, Saturday, Cheryl likely woke up and went about her day, like not really giving the night before a second thought. Remember, she and Kristen weren't close, so she wouldn't have called her to check in or anything like that. And what happens over the next few days, or what doesn't happen, to be more precise, is very reminiscent of Cindy's song, the college student who went missing from Penn State, who we covered in our third episode. Yeah. So this was the holiday weekend, so it wasn't weird that no one had seen Kristen, you know? Like, she had some loose plans with friends, but nothing big. Nothing like, I think she was... No, like, I yeah. think she was supposed to have lunch with somebody on Saturday, and she didn't show, and, you know, the, her friend got a little worried. But again, it's, you know, that's not an emergency. But then um, when she didn't show up for breakfast on Sunday... Like they, her friends did start to get a little more concerned and they did start to kind of like ask each other, Hey, have you seen Kristen? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like when's the last time we saw her? Like what's going on? You know, they kind of started that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
And again, no cell phones, so it's nope. not like they can text her and get a quick response. Yeah, I mean, presumably they called her room. Yeah. But, I mean, a you know. College student. Yeah. Yeah. Kristen's parents started to get a little concerned on Sunday when they never heard from their daughter, who not only called every Sunday, but, you know, left that message on Friday saying that she had good news and that she would tell them about it on Sunday. Right. But again, like a college student not calling her parents one time isn't the craziest thing yeah. that's ever happened. There's there's no big alarm bells being No, raised it's it's right now. it's all very small yeah. red flags at this point. The alarm bells didn't really start to ring until Kristen's roommate, Crystal Calvin, returned to campus on Monday, which was May 27th. She noticed that, one, Kristen wasn't home, and two, her personal belongings that she carried with her every day were still in the room, like her wallet, like, you know, Mm. all that kind of stuff. So that day, Crystal made at least two calls to campus police who were initially hesitant to take her concerns seriously. However, late in the day on that Monday, they did call Kristen's parents to just ask if she was home with them. Why didn't they take the the first call seriously from her roommate? Because it was a holiday weekend and she was like, and they were like, well, she probably just went somewhere. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was really as simple as that. Like, they just weren't very interested at all. But when campus police call Kristen's parents, her parents obviously start to freak out because right. they know she's not home with them. And, yeah, you and know, the campus police are calling. Well, exactly. And Kristen yeah. wasn't, you know, yes, she loved to travel and she loved to do stuff, but she wasn't the type of kid who would just like split for the weekend and not, and tell, not anyone, tell anybody. You yeah. know, it was very out of character for her. So they got very concerned. And Stan, Kristen's dad, headed down to campus the next morning, which was Tuesday, to look for his daughter. He went to Cal Poly looking for answers, but instead was met with resistance, incompetence, and maybe even a cover-up by administration. Uh. Stan got to campus and was immediately unimpressed by campus police, who had very little information to give him. So he started looking for Kristen on his own, aided by one of Kristen's friends, Margarita. Together, they put up flyers and Margarita tried to piece together when Kristen was last seen and with whom. So she was actually friends with Tim Davis, the guy who started walking with Kristen, Cheryl and Paul. Right. Um, so she asked him to like call Kristen's mom and tell her, you know, about the night, about what he had seen and, you know, yeah. what was going on. But oddly, despite like telling Margarita that he would, he never did. Hmm. So meanwhile, on Tuesday, the family also tried to file a missing persons report with the San Luis Obispo police, but they were told it was too soon. Okay. How many days has she been gone? She was last seen basically Friday night. Technically, it was Saturday morning because it was like 2 a.m. Yeah or 3 a.m., whatever it was. Nobody had seen her during daylight hours of Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and now we're on Tuesday. So, I mean, like, how long, how long is it? That's four days. I know, that's my question. And, like, and again, I get it. I mean, just like the police in the Cindy Song case said, you know, like, hey, we're in a college town. This type of thing happens all the time. They always show back up. Yeah. But clearly, sometimes they don't. Yeah. And four days, and four days though, and is a long time. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah. Th- it, that seems like they were just blowing him off. Yeah, it yeah, it absolutely does. Oh, and campus police for some reason also refused to write a missing persons report, and they didn't actually end up doing it until weeks later. Why? Why did? Why did they? Refused to write a missing persons report. I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of theories basically that Cal Poly just did not. They didn't want the bad press. Yeah. They didn't want that to be on them, basically. Huh. So when they finally did write this report, like I said, several weeks later, there was something crazy in it. The report stated that Denise Smart, Kristen's mom, had said that Kristen had been on a camping trip. Yeah, but like Denise said, she never said that. And it's something that sounds a little too specific to be an error. Yeah. 
where where did they get that? No idea. So the smart family thinks that it was put in to basically take responsibility off of the school. Like, yeah, maybe she's missing, but she was, she went missing from somewhere else, not here. Oh yeah. 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 And if that seems a little paranoid, like maybe, but that's not the only shady thing that Cal Poly did. Even though it was a couple of weeks before they would do a missing persons report, Campus police did start interviewing people prior to that, but even that was almost a week after her disappearance. Hmm. They brought in the three people who walked with Kristen that night, like as you would expect, Tim Davis, Cheryl Anderson, and Paul Flores. They interviewed the three students, but there was something strange about Paul. He came to the interview with a black eye and scratches. And did they ask him about that? Of course, yeah. And he was like, yeah, no, I don't know how I got the black eye. (laughs) I just woke up with it. And they just accepted that? They were just like, all right, move on? Yeah, evidently, because they said that there was no evidence of foul play in Kristen's disappearance after they did those interviews. What about the scratches, though? That's, That's more important to me than the black eye. Yeah, no, I know. And, and I don't, the scratches, so I did see a picture of him right around this time. You can see the black guy. The scratches weren't on his face. I did read that the scratches were like on his knees. So the police might not have known about that at that point. Okay. Because he might've just, you know, been wearing pants. Right, yeah. Days and weeks pass. The school year ended, and whether it was because they were inept or because they wanted to just sweep this whole ugly business under the rug, the school seemingly proceeded with standard plans, which included sending in cleaning crews to clean and sanitize the dorms, including Paul's. You gotta be kidding me. Nope. This campus police, I'm assuming that they don't have detectives I I mean, you know more about how campus police work than I do. Like, so I have no idea. Penn State, campus police, if it was a major crime, would turn it over to the local jurisdiction, which literally was right across the street. So Mm -hmm. it's not like that was crazy and everybody knew each other. Yeah. Um, But yeah, but I I wouldn't think that the campus police itself. They wouldn't lead lead an investigation. Yeah, and they, they wouldn't have detectives. They would just have officers, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there might be some sort of investigative branch, mm-hmm. depending on how large the the campus is, mm-hmm. but they're not going to be like full time detectives, right? Yeah. yeah, because honestly, if you like went to a school that had a full time detective, like that does sound kind of terrifying. Yeah, right. <laughs> like yeah. if your school can justify <laughs> having a full time detective, like, that's a little like, scary. Maybe you shouldn't go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So it sounds to me like nobody was taking charge of the investigation. It was kind of piecemeal. Exactly. Because it just seems like they didn't want to admit that an investigation was even warranted, really. Right. You know? Yeah. It seemed like they were just kind of going through the motions, just like waiting for her to show back up. So about a month goes by and the dorm has been sanitized and students have been questioned, but there was still no sign of the college freshmen and Cal Poly police finally admitted that they needed help. But oddly, and this goes to what you were saying before about Penn State, because like you would think that they would contact the local police. Right. So they didn't contact the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Department. They instead contacted the DA's office. Okay. So when I was reading about this, there is some confusion as to why Um, There's the speculation is that there might have been some bad blood between the campus police and the sheriff's department. And so maybe that's why they didn't want to turn it over at all at first. And then when they finally realized they had to, they just tried to circumvent them altogether. Yeah. uh, Maybe the DA's office has special investigators assigned to it that could handle this. Yeah. And, and they did have investigators. Yeah. And so in the DA's office, like did start an investigation. So, you know, it's, it does seem a little weird, but things at least started to get moving. Yeah. 
So the first thing the DA's office did was read through the interview transcripts and then they brought everybody back in. To re-interview? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And it's especially good because this is where Paul's story started to develop holes. So the black guy and the scratches and everything, now he's saying that he got them from a pickup basketball game. Okay. Yeah, he says basically like he was playing basketball and somebody elbowed him in the face. So it went from I don't know to I got elbowed in the face at a basketball game. Yeah, and I think that's, and I think it's, so at some point during this time, like the scratches became known. known. And like I said, a lot of them were on his knees and stuff. And so like, I think, so he also used the basketball game to kind of explain that away. You know, he fell like whatever. Sure, yeah. But one of the people that Paul played with that day, um, because he actually did play basketball like that Sunday or whatever, he said that he had already had those injuries when he got to the basketball game. Mm -hmm. So then Paul eventually changed that story to, I got the black eye when I was installing a CD player in my truck. (laughs) (laughs) Did the truck punch him? Well, no. It, so if I remember correctly, he was like pulling the old stereo out and like punched himself in the face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, the investigators also were like, uh, all right, dude, like, are you like, are you serious with this? Yeah. So they were like, hey, how about you take a polygraph? And Paul said, oh, yeah, of course. Sure, uh-huh. definitely. Yeah, I'll yeah. absolutely I'll, I'll take t- a poly. I'll love. totally pass that. Yeah, I'll love I'll it. But weirdly, he kept on putting it off. Mm. And, you know, school's over at this point. So, like, Paul's gone. Like, he's back home. And finally, investigators were like, no, you don't get to just split <laughs> and, like, not do this. So they went to Arroyo Grande, where Paul lived with his parents, and said, like, hey, it's time to take the polygraph. And they ended up taking him to the local police station there, but he still refused to take the polygraph, even when he got to the police station. But he did agree to an interview. So now he's like getting interviewed again and in it, he denies doing anything to Kristen. You know, he says, I got her home or, you know, whatever. And his his story also changes a little bit here too, because at one point, like he said that he got her to the dorm at another point, he says that he just saw her walking like, cause his dorm was first, her dorm was behind his. So at one point he says that like he stopped at, his dorm and And then saw her go to her dorm and was just like, I don't know what happened after that. I assume she got there. Something else must have happened. But he admitted to having to carry her from the party to that intersection. Yeah. It sounds like it. I don't, it doesn't sound like that was uh, like that part of the account was ever in question. Right. But so then all of a sudden this, this girl that needed to be basically carry oh walked off on her own walked off on her own yeah that is a good point yeah. i mean it, the, i i get it yeah you know alcohol does strange things to people or whatever but like come on yeah no she you're, needed she needed a, a a crutch basically basically to get back to her dorm but then oh no bye yeah now you can walk on your own no and that's that's a really really good point so as this interview goes on and i think it lasted about 90 minutes um, Paul kind of began to pull himself into a fetal position and like do that thing where he put his shirt over his knees, you know, <laughs> and like he seemed ready to break. And so investigators are like, okay, we have him. Yeah. But apparently one of the investigators got like a little overbearing and Paul just kind of snapped out of it. And the interview ended with Paul saying, quote, if you're so smart, then tell me where the body is, end quote. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, like it escalated quickly. Uh, tell me where the body is. Yeah. I mean, because they, they knew his story was just nonsense, right? Sure. And yeah. so I think they were just going after him hard. Like, we know you did something to her. Like, just tell us where she is. Like, you know, just tell us what happens, blah, blah, blah. Like, doing the whole thing, you know, that cops do in an interrogation when they're trying to get a confession, which it sounds like that was their goal at that point. 
All right. So it, it, it's it's not him saying show me where the body is wasn't like completely out of the blue or spontaneous. No, 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 say. no. I think they were coming at him pretty hard. Okay. Yeah. So police obviously didn't know where the body was, but it should be noted that about two days after Kristen went missing, Paul's parents um, poured a slab of concrete in the backyard of a home they owned on East Branch Street in Arroyo Grande. Just, you know, coincidentally. So you think the parents are involved in this too? Well, I mean, I'm just saying, two days later, they did some landscaping that involved concrete, as you do. After the DA's office like goes back and does all these interviews, they finally hand the case over to the sheriff's office. Huh. So the sheriff at the time, Ed Williams, started his investigation at the source, the Cal Poly campus. They brought in four cadaver dogs and examined the path that the students took from the party to the dorms that night. And there weren't any hits or anything there. But once the dogs were taken inside the buildings, it was a totally different story. Hmm, even after the buildings had been sanitized. Yep. So this is summertime. Um, the dorms are closed. They've been cleaned out. They've been sanitized. Um, but yeah, the dogs did still find something. When they went to Santa Lucia Hall, where Paul lived, like the handlers were just set loose with the dogs inside. They weren't told that that was the hall where Paul lived. Mm -hmm. They weren't told what room Paul was in, you know, nothing. They were just like, hey, you're going to go to these places, see if you find anything. The dogs independently hit on room 128, which was Paul's room. Huh. And even though it had been sanitized, as we mentioned, each dog, there were four, alerted in three areas of the room. Paul's bed, a trash can, and the telephone. Huh. However, because the room had already been cleaned, there wasn't any physical evidence right. that anything had happened in the room. Yeah. But authorities were convinced that either a dead body had been in room 128 or that someone who had been in contact with a dead body had been in that room. They were so confident that Under Sheriff Steve Boltz publicly said that at the time. Mm, wow. Yeah. So now investigators have their sights set on Paul Flores and decide to expand their investigation. So they headed to Arroyo Grande and executed two search warrants, one on Paul's father's home on White Court, where Paul often stayed when he wasn't at school, and one on that home in East Branch. Where, where the fresh slab of concrete mm -hmm. was poured. Yeah, and that house was vacant at the time. It was actually like an investment property. Mm -hmm. So Paul's parents at this time um, had been kind of having marital trouble and were on and off. So at one point, I think Paul's mom bought that house and like was living in it. And then they got back together and then it just kind of became this investment property. Gotcha. But at the time it was vacant, um, though it was usually rented out. So while this seems like police were finally making some headway, the Smart family was not impressed by these searches. Mm -hmm. Apparently, investigators just kind of poked around. Like they didn't really thoroughly search the homes. There were no cadaver dogs and none of the vehicles were searched. Yeah, why wouldn't they bring cadaver dogs? They, they brought cadaver dogs in. To, to the, the dorms, dorm. yeah. Why wouldn't they bring them to the houses? That's what the Smart family wanted to know. They couldn't understand it. Like, they didn't understand what the point of that was, you know? Like, they didn't think that anyone in the Flores family was, like, holding Kristen hostage yeah. <laughs> at their house or something, you know? Right. Yeah, and so all that they really turned up were some clippings, newspaper clippings, about Kristen's disappearance under a bed. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. No, it doesn't. I mean, it's creepy. Yeah, definitely. For sure. <laughs> but no, you're right. It doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of an investigation. However, in October of 96, what could prove to be a bombshell piece of evidence was found. 
Mary Lassiter was the new tenant at the Flores' East Branch home in Arroyo Grande. She knew about Kristen's case, which had been all over the news. I mean, it was a huge case. Like you could not escape escape it in you know in California at right. that time. Yeah. She found an earring in her driveway that appeared to match a necklace that Kristen was wearing in one of her missing posters. Oh wow. Yeah. And the way, and I've seen that picture and we'll post it on the blog too. So like Kristen had long, straight blonde hair. And in that picture in question, she is wearing this like really elaborate silver necklace. Like it's large Mm. and it's very unique. I mean, this isn't something that you just got at the jewelry store at the mall, you know, Um, but her hair is down. So you can't see if she's wearing earrings or not. Mm -hmm. So like she had no idea if that was even a set at all or, you know, anything, but she found it in her driveway. It, she knew who owned her house. You know, it bothered her enough that she called the sheriff's department. So they sent out a deputy and the earring was bagged. And so it's like, okay, this is great. Like this is because there's no, there's no evidence in this case. Right. Like, you know, it's, only this just is the first piece of yeah, potential. Yeah, evidence. potential. I mean, yeah, we have no idea if it has anything to do with Kristen at all. Right. But when you have literally no physical evidence, it's a huge deal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you would expect like, okay, they came in back, did you expect they run tests? Like they'd see if there's any DNA on it, mm-hmm. you know, if there's any sort of evidence whatsoever. But though it was bagged, it was never entered into evidence, and it was eventually lost. Uh, Okay. This was a rental unit, so, you know, the earring very well could have had nothing to do with the case. But also, like, it could have had the entire key to the investigation. Like, they could have held it in their hand in 1996. This is just Five months after Kristen was last seen like this, it could have literally been solved because if Kristen's earring, like let's say they had it, let's say they did DNA, let's say it was Kristen's, right? Mm -hmm. If her earring is in the driveway of Paul Flores's family's home in Arroyo Grande, California, and Paul's the prime suspect, there's no logical explanation for that. No, and it gives them enough to do more thorough searches. Oh, I mean, everything. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think it's enough to make an arrest at that point um, because there's still no hard evidence. There's still no body. I mean, sure, there's no body, but dear God, like there's no reasonable explanation for her earring to be in that driveway. Right, but you wouldn't arrest because you don't know what you'd be charging him with. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Because so, at that, yes. At that point, they're basically just not there yet. Right. But they, I mean, that would have been so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Key. No, again. And that, to have, again, five months later, in yeah. five months, yes, I'm sure felt like an eternity at the time to the smarts. But yeah. I mean, in the grand scheme of these cases, as we've seen, it's not. It's nothing. And it could, they just could have had it. Yeah. But instead, the investigation just like kind of petered out for a while. But the smarts were convinced at this point that Paul had something to do with their daughter's disappearance. So in an effort to rev up the investigation, they filed a $40 million civil wrongful death lawsuit against Paul Flores in November of 1997. So the next year. So this is just like a little over about a year and a half since Kristen went missing. And they obviously weren't trying to get $40 million from Paul. Yeah, he doesn't have that. No. What they were trying to do was to get him to testify under oath. Right. So he was compelled to testify, but he pled the fifth to everything. He did not answer a single question other than what his name was. And he wouldn't even say whether or not he was even at that party on May 24th. He pled the fifth. Um, I think it was 27 times. Mm. Interesting. And then, you know, at some point, and I'm a little unclear on the timing of this at some point, a grand jury was convened hmm. in this case. And apparently prosecutors even offered Paul a plea deal. Like they offered him six years if he would just tell them where Kristen was. Hmm. 
And he, of course, didn't take it. Nothing ever came of the grand jury. It didn't go anywhere. Because, I mean, they had nothing. Yeah, there's, you know? there's no physical evidence linking him to anything. No, not at all. So, yeah, they had nothing. But, you know, I guess there was just kind of like a shot in the dark yeah. at that point, you yeah. know, to see if they could intimidate him. Yeah, I was just going to say it's a scare tactic. Yeah, exactly. And it did not work. So, yeah. So, at you know, at the end of 97, like, the smart family is basically still at square one. Over the years, this case didn't get very far, but the smart family did not let up pressure, right? So they kept it going. Like they didn't let it just end up in a filing cabinet somewhere. So over the years, a variety of searches were done for Kristen and evidence in the case, one in particular of note was conducted on June twentieth, two thousand, just over four years after Kristen's disappearance. The warrant was for that house that the Flores family owns on East Branch Street. What's unclear is the point of this search, like because it was four years after Kristen went missing, and it was a rental property, so like all sorts of people had been in and out. So the possibility of finding any physical evidence was slim at that point. So the warrant was just a general search of the property or was it a specific location at the property? I believe this one was just a general search of the property. It was it was relatively broad. Okay. There were some later on that would only cover certain areas of the property. But this one, I think they pretty much, you know, had the whole property and you know so it would have made sense to see if Kristen was like buried back there perhaps yeah Yeah. you know which had been the theory of many people at that point um but the sheriff's office didn't dig as part of the search warrant okay so four years later nothing new in the case Mm mm-hmm they just decide to go and research Mm -hmm. this property a a second time very generally, not specifically looking for her body. No, apparently not, because, yeah, there is no digging. So, of course, reporters, because, again, the rumors of Kristen being buried in this yard had already been going around Uh for quite a while, right? And so when this happened, reporters are like, so are you going to dig up the backyard or what? And, you know, the sheriff's office said no. And Or even use ground penetrating, penetrating radar or bringing cadaver dogs out. Well, so they actually did use ground penetrating radar on this. But, you know, this was 2000 and that technology was new at the time. And apparently it was a lot less effective than it is now. I mean, they had ground penetrating radar in Jurassic Park. Like that was, a, <laughs> I know it's stupid to compare they it to. They also had dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. <laughs> okay. But I, I mean, I, I know it's stupid no, I get comparing what you're it to a movie, but like that technology did exist. It probably wasn't as great as it is now, but. Well, like, yeah. And I think that's the point. So like, yes, it did exist. They did use it, but you know, people looking back on it, with, you know, 2021 eyes. Oh, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Are saying that technology. Yeah. yeah, The technology wasn't as good because they didn't find anything. And so, you know, a lot of people are saying, see, 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 she's not back there where a lot of other people are saying, well, you know, she could be, the technology wasn't good. They didn't actually dig. They didn't bring cadaver dogs, you know? So what's interesting though, is that the sheriff's office, when asked about this claimed that they couldn't dig because the warrant was, you know, written too narrowly for Uh that, right? Uh However, the warrant was actually written by Jack Schaefer, who was an FBI agent, and he just called bullshit on that. He said, quote, the first warrant authorized a dig. I know this because I provided most of the information for the warrant. I forced the warrant on a skeptical police force, I was told that the officers present did not want to pay to have the concrete repaired if the search turned up nothing. That was a lost opportunity. End quote. What? 
who cared? Like the those officers shouldn't care about paying for concrete repair. It's not like it's going to be coming out of their pockets. <laughs> I know. And the under sheriff at the time, like he wanted to dig, but apparently the sheriff's office at this time uh, made decisions like this by a committee so that like no one would be forced to take the blame for oh. anything. And so he was literally just outvoted. <laughs> And that's what it is. It sounds like it literally came down to money. They're like, well, you know, if we go into this private citizen's home and we bust up their concrete and we don't find a body under there, then, uh uh-oh, we're going to have to, like, pay to fix all of this. Okay, well, then petition the city to raise taxes the next year to cover it. Like, that's... Yeah. That's not a budgetary concern. Yeah, I know, but it was to them. And so, again... If Kristen was there or if any evidence related to Kristen was there, this case could have been solved in 2000, 21 years ago, and just four years after her disappearance. It's a shitty way to run a police department. Well, trust me, the Smart family agreed. (laughs) They were not thrilled with the way things were going. But... Other searches were done. Like periodically, this case would just pop up in the news because, like, another search warrant would be executed. They do something. Like, they gave the appearance of this case being active without actually accomplishing anything. Mm -hmm. But in 2011, a new sheriff was elected and he seemed to be invested in cracking this case. So between 2011 and 2020, according to an article in the New York Times, the sheriff's office, led by Sheriff Ian Parkinson, executed 18 search warrants, submitted 37 items for DNA testing. And these are all items from like the beginning of the investigation that had never been submitted for DNA testing. So they took all of this early evidence and submitted it. They recovered 140 additional items of evidence and conducted 91 interviews. Wow. Yeah. So again, 2011 really does seem to have been a turning point in this case with this new sheriff. Like he, I don't know, whatever political nonsense had been going on before with all these different agencies, but like this guy, he was literally like, there's a new sheriff in town and like really started to try to get things done. So before we go any further and get into the big break in the case that just happened this week, We are going to leave you for this week, but I want to get your impressions of this, you know, before we go, as somebody who's just never heard this story before. Up to this point, it's, it, it's a botched investigation. And I I think that, um, taking all the conspiracy theories out of it, um, the campus police not having any type of lead investigator on it and mm-hmm. not turning it over right away when they knew it was something that was out of their control is what ultimately ended up messing up the case. Hmm. Because if you don't have one person or a couple of, of people controlling the evidence, controlling the case, controlling what's happening in the case and where it's going, you know, you have all of these hands mixed into it. Who's the overwatch of the case? Right. So that's to me that's the in, my initial thought process. I'm still so confused as to why the why the sheriffs when they executed that search warrant didn't dig up the backyard or bring cadaver dogs at the very least yeah. because I feel like if they were worried about the money, right? And they're like, "Oh, we don't want to do it if in case nobody's there and then we have to pay the money." Like, bring the cadaver dogs and then at least maybe you'll feel a little bit more secure in the choice right. of whether or not to dig. Yeah, if they don't hit on anything. Yeah, then you're like, "Okay, then- well, like we can feel confident that we don't need to dig this up." Or if they do hit on it, then they can say, "Okay, like chances are there we're going to find something, so it's worth it." Who was running that search warrant? 
Because from the this, sheriff, yeah, there was the sheriff's department, so well, the no, FBI I, was I, involved. I, I get that, but like, is there a lead investigator? Is there one person that's that one detective that is spearheading this, or is it just a group of sheriffs out there executing a search warrant? And they're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I don't know, but it that's what it sounds like. It sounds like, again, there's no lead investigator. There's no one person that is taking charge of this case. Yeah, and I don't know. I, I don't know if there was, like, one person or if it was just the sheriff by default or or what it was. Um, but, yeah, but it does sound like, like I said earlier, that these decisions were kind of made by committee and not by one person spearheading it and that the under sheriff didn't have the clout to, to get that dug up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, even when he had the FBI behind him. Yeah. I, I don't understand it. I don't yeah. understand that at all. So now what, what's your take on the, the Cal Poly aspect of it? Like, do you think that the school administration was trying to cover it up or do you think they were just really bad at everything uh so i don't know how the leadership chain yeah works on that campus and when i say that um i'm referencing penn state mm -hmm. so basically the people that were in charge of the campus police at penn state uh were not law enforcement mm -hmm. it, the higher up you go so some of the bigger decisions Bigger decisions that were govern governing law enforcement actions were made by people that were not law enforcement. Okay. Um, so there were administration yes. for the college? Yes. Okay. So if that is the same at this campus, then I think it's more a lack of knowledge mm. of what to do. Mm -hmm. And because this is campus police and I'm not, I'm not, diminishing campus police in general but because there probably again was not a detective there was not a lead investigator pushing for things they were probably just pushing off the case right and not actively investigating it that's my take the cleaning and the sanitizing of paul's room oh, that, well, oh. yeah i mean that i don't know yeah. Because uh, that, like nobody should have touched his room. Yeah. Y you have you have a, a, an active missing persons case. Why? Why would you? Why? What's it going to hurt to put that off a couple of weeks? I know. But again, if it's an unorganized investigation with nobody leading it up, nobody's gonna nobody's gonna push for that. Yeah. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna think it. to stop that. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, obviously, it's not like they went in and specially cleaned and sanitized Paul Flores' room. Like, right. it was the end of the year. That's just what they do at yeah. the end of the year. Yeah, but you're right. There's they, just nobody who had the knowledge or whatever to stop them. Yeah. And clearly, they, they didn't do a great job of cleaning. It, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, the cadaver dogs, dogs did hit. But if there was any other evidence it's that was gone. in there, yeah. it was gone. Hairs, I mean, crew. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anything, any fluids. Any bodily fluids would mm -hmm. have been cleaned up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a very long and windy and frustrating case that, again, has gone on for almost 25 years. So this year, this May, is the 25th anniversary of Kristen Smart's disappearance. And it wasn't until literally a week ago that it looked like we were finally going to have a resolution. So next week, we are going to get into more about Paul Flores, about what type of person he is, like what he was up to after Kristen's disappearance in 1996. And uh, we will get us caught up right to the present and, you know, talk about exactly what is going on with the Kristen Smart case right now. So you, honey, don't 
like look at the news. I won't <laughs> between I, now I, and I, then. I won't do any research <laughs> on it. I will. I will be as uh, as ignorant of the case as <laughs> as I was tonight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that next week. But in the meantime, and you don't even know this because, like, I just don't tell you things. Um, but we are now on Patreon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So I made, so this is how like yeah, unhinged you, I am. When you said you had an announcement, I was like, God, are you pregnant again? Oh my God. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something terrible? Um, no. So we're on Patreon. So if you guys want to, you can support us on there or like don't because it's a pandemic. So, you know, who cares? But we are there. And because to me, this entire quarantine COVID situation that we've been going through for the past year has really been defined by like me starting this podcast <laughs> and listening to Taylor Swift. Like, I feel like that's all I've been doing for the past year is listening to folklore and evermore and thinking about and doing this podcast. Um, all of our tiers on Patreon are named after Taylor Swift songs. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> So you can check that out. Um, we are also on all the socials, as you usually mention. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and even on TikTok, which you kind of knew about but have never seen. Nope. Nope. Don't so it doesn't have, matter. So Ethan's not going to go do it, but you can go do it if you want. Yeah. Um, all right. So we will see you here next week for a brand new episode, part two two of the Kristen Smart case. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketsa. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!